So it's very nice indeed to be talking to you today. And my name is Anthony Selden, and I wrote a book called The Impossible Office, which is now out in paperback. And when I wrote the first edition in 2021, which was the 300th anniversary exactly of Britain's first prime minister being asked to do the job, uh, back in April 1721, um, it seemed as if the title chosen for the book, Impossible Office, was perhaps a bit of an exaggeration. But now, three years on, um, events have shown that uh, the question, is it possible to do uh, the job of prime minister uh, anymore, uh, is far more pertinent uh, since that book was published. Boris Johnson crashed badly. Liz Truss, remember her, has crashed badly. And Rishi Sunak is enduring huge problems. So uh, that is the uh, position that we are in. And uh, I think the book is very timely. I hope so. Because the job of prime minister fascinates the whole country and uh, most people are interested in politics um, and the number one person they're interested in uh, either uh, liking them or hating them is the prime minister and uh, i think in a way perhaps even more so following the death of the queen that happened in the intervening a period between the first edition and the paperback, I think it's focused attention on uh, almost a vacuum at the top of the uh, political spectrum. And uh, so much had happened uh, since, um, uh, including Boris Johnson imploding, uh, Liz Truss imploding, and uh, Rishi Sunak looking as if he is uh, going to implode. I mean, I think he's... Uh, uh, got better qualities that, than uh, bet than either of uh, those people, either Rishi Sunak or Liz Truss, but he's just finding the job almost impossible to do. I mean, it's a fascinating question. Who on earth would want to have the job of prime minister when uh, almost everyone fails or falls short? I mean, you'd have to be mad, wouldn't you? So, well, that depends how long the reign goes on for, doesn't it? How ill is the king? I would say that none of those 15 prime ministers under Queen Elizabeth II were iconic. None of them, well, one made the top tier, Churchill um, and, uh, uh, and Thatcher, but um, so they're the exceptions. But uh, the great majority of them disappointed. Um, many of them had considerable qualities to be prime minister, but they either misjudged uh, the moment uh, or the conditions were so adverse against them that they didn't have a hope. So um, it has been um, over 30 years since Britain's had a prime minister, whether we uh, love her or, or loathe her, Margaret Thatcher, who has made the weather and indeed we're still living here um nearly 34 years after she stood down under her shadow uh thatcher is the one almost the only factor and adherence to thatcherism that holds the conservative party together and uh so it's been an interesting time it, it has not been a vintage period for uh premiership under Elizabeth, I think that she did play a role in helping to steer them. Uh, now, exactly what that is, we will uh, possibly never know, because interestingly, the uh, practice of the prime minister and the uh, monarch meeting together once a week began only in the Second World War with George VI having lunch with Winston Churchill during the war. And that practice then carried on uh, with a weekly audience. Um, 
Now, nobody is present at that, those occasions and no one takes notes. So the Queen may or may not have written up what happened in her diary that she may or may not have kept. Uh, but the Prime Minister should not be talking about it. So in other words, exactly what was said will remain um, unclear. But the general steer that the monarch gave the monarch, gave the Prime Minister is not that she had noticeable effect on Boris Johnson, who was so wayward, uh, he was beyond advice. There are some things that the Prime Minister can do to make their life better. And I talk about this in the final chapter of the book. So uh, the relationship with the Chancellor of the Exchequer is one of the factors that have gone wrong. So the Chancellor has regularly undermined the Prime Minister. So conspicuous amongst that was uh, um, Dennis Healy uh, with uh, Jim Callaghan, the Labour Prime Minister in the late 1970s, uh, Gordon Brown with Tony Blair, um, and Philip Hammond uh, with Theresa May, uh, and then Rishi Sunak with Boris Johnson. So uh, that's a, a really common pattern. And clearly the Chancellor and the Prime Minister need to work more closely together. And so I come up with proposals for that. The Chancellor of the Exchequer is only the second Lord of the Treasury. The Prime Minister is the first Lord of the Treasury. And the Prime Ministers have uh, found it hard to assert that superiority over the all important uh, finances of the nation. That's one thing they can do. Second thing they can do is uh, not to be so reactive. One of the reasons why Prime Ministers have gone astray is that uh, they have prioritised the urgent over the important. So uh, they have looked at the 24 hour news cycle. They say, oh, this is terrible 24 hour news cycle. Now, WhatsApp groups and uh, uh, and social media, we're going to have to respond to this and to that. No, they don't. Um, great leaders uh, move in a slower time uh, than the uh, uh, caffeine uh, rich uh, adrenaline rich way in which prime ministers operate, uh, they lose the strategy, they lose the important and, uh, for the sake of the urgent, you don't have to respond. Um, and it's entirely their own making. Uh, and the third uh, uh, way that they can improve is to actually become much clearer about what they want to do. So to be a successful prime minister, you have to have a clear plan that many prime ministers have not had. Tony Blair did not have a clear plan for office in 1997. Gordon Brown did not in um, 2007. Uh, David Cameron did not in uh, 2010, nor did Theresa May and on, on, on it goes. So you've got to have a clear plan. Now, uh, Liz Truss had a clear plan, but it also has to be realistic. You need a clear and realistic plan. and. Uh, Prime Ministers need to be doing far more to produce uh, proposals which are properly costed and then uh, which are presented in a programme for government um, which locks the Chancellor in so you don't have the endless petty counterproductive squabbling uh, between the Chancellor and the Prime Minister that's characterised so many uh, of uh, recent premierships uh, to the detriment of the country. Um, and I just to mention the fourth thing, they've got to learn more history. And one of the points you learn from history is that you need to be there for a long time. I mean, no uh, prime minister, all the top nine prime ministers I talk about in the book have all been in office for more than five or six years and many of them much longer. You need time uh, to in office to do your job properly. Um, you need to know how to do it. Um, and um, you need to keep your ministers in office. Now, in the last uh, 14 years, uh, which I talk about in another book that Cambridge uh, University Press publishing later this year on the um, impact of the Conservative government since 2010, 
Uh, one of the reasons for the low performance, disappointing performance of the Conservatives since then is the regular chair, not least of prime ministers, but also uh, cabinet ministers. Let's just take one, education. There have been 10 education secretaries. That means that uh, the average length of service is one year and four months. Nobody uh, can do the job in one year and four months. And many of the people appointed uh, know nothing about education anyway. They're appointed for political, not governmental reasons. So they've got to uh, start taking uh, politics and government much more seriously than uh, uh, either the heavily ideological um, trust or the callous um, and uh, uh, self-regarding uh, Johnson uh, you've got to start taking it seriously. I mean, Liz Truss claimed to be a big follower of Margaret Thatcher. Well, Margaret Thatcher didn't rush in and have a mini budget in her first month as Prime Minister in 1979. She waited two years until 1981 to launch her major budget when she had, uh, as they say, rolled the pitch uh, and uh, checked that she knew what she was doing. And so the lack of learning from history is astonishing. Uh, you would uh, you'd be surprised, as I talk about in the book, uh, most prime ministers pitch up to number 10, knowing less about the office of prime minister than the average A-level politics student. And that's shocking, isn't it? Uh, no one would appoint somebody to be head of the post office. Or, well, actually, maybe that's a the wrong example, but being serious, no one would appoint somebody to be head of Cambridge University Press or uh, of a major company, uh, BP, or a, a major uh, lawyer company or a football club, um, uh, unless they actually knew about what the industry was all about. And yet, for some reason, these people pitch up in number 10, not knowing what the job is about and without the interest or the humility to find out about it and without a proper plan either for government. I mean, it's you couldn't believe it, but it's true and it contributes to why the office has become impossible. No, uh, not at all. It's uh, uh, the unprecedented change, including the invasion uh, of Ukraine um, and the impact on um, uh, on food prices and the cost of living uh, has um, and fuel prices. Uh, it, it's been a uh, and house prices. It has been an extraordinarily turbulent period um, and it hasn't catalyzed a change in the office of prime minister. Now, um, I have been working with the Institute for Government um, with, on an idea which I took to them for a commission on the centre, which is being published or will have been published in uh, early uh, March. Um, and that outlines a series of proposals which I talk about in the book for improving uh, the Prime Minister, I would be so bold as to say that whoever wins in uh, later in 2024 or just possibly January 2025, which is the last possible date for the general election, whoever wins, obviously it's at the moment uh, almost inevitably going to be Labour, but it's just possible that that will change, uh, that uh, they will have a much better premiership uh, if they read this book. Um, uh, and read it carefully and not just them, but all their staff and not just all their staff, but all their family and not just all their family, but all their family's friends um, and their friends, friends. Uh, this will be uh, a game changer. Uh, and uh, we need to see that happen. I mean, slightly more seriously there. The proposals in the book will show a prime minister how to be prime minister and how to be effective and how they can emulate those highly successful prime ministers. It's fun. Uh, it's fun. It's about us. Uh, it tells you why we are the way we 
are and uh, it tells us about so much to be uh, proud of it, it's rich in in information i mean things like how on earth did the prime minister communicate with the nation and for the first 150 years the prime minister never went abroad and hardly ever traveled around the country and then the coming of uh, the uh, telephone uh, into uh, number 10 at the end of the 19th century made a huge difference although even 50 years after it arrived many prime ministers like the conservative prime minister Stanley Baldwin didn't want to use the prime didn't want to use the phone because he said memorably that's not how gentlemen conduct their business um but but the way that technology has uh, completely transformed the prime minister uh and and travel uh the first car the prime minister used only 120 years ago with uh, prime minister balfour and uh, the first uh, prime minister to fly abroad um was uh, 85 years ago only with chamberlain going flying off to see Hitler and the first helicopter a prime minister used, a very, very frightened uh, prime minister, Harold Macmillan, uh, being flown uh, by helicopter with President Kennedy to Camp David. So uh, how recent and, and, and how extraordinary uh, change has been in, in Britain and to our leaders. And I think at the end of the day, uh, point that I finished the book with is they're just human beings, the 57 prime ministers, and they hurt. They're often more sensitive than uh, we are. Uh, and they are uh, often don't enjoy the job very much while saying, of course, they love the job. But frustration and hurt and humiliation and worry about their uh, partners usually wives um, and their impact on their children um, uh, really concerns them. And so few prime ministers have really enjoyed their existence after their time uh, as prime minister. It's very, very difficult. If being, uh, if being prime minister is almost an impossible job, though if they read the book, uh, they can find out how to make it possible job, not impossible job. Uh, if being prime minister is almost impossible, being post-Prime Minister is totally impossible. But that's another book.